This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week. You know, if you had asked me just a couple of years ago, even a year ago, what the future for the Canadian auto industry is, I would have told you I'm not very optimistic. And then just in the last few months, General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis have announced that they're going to invest billions of dollars in Canada to make electric cars. So how did that all come about? And what does it portend for the future? We're going to get to the bottom of that today with three experts I've got coming on the show, including Flavio Volpe. He's the president of the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association. Eric Rondeau is a senior strategic advisor for battery and electrification initiatives with Investissement Quebec International. And Colin McCarricker is a head transport analyst with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And I want to thank all three of you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Well, let's start uh, here, John. Yeah. Uh, Flavio, I'm going to start with you. I mean, these announcements from GM, Ford, and Chrysler, amazing. GM's going to build the electric bright drop van in Ingersoll, Canada. Ford announced that it's going to build an electric version of the Lincoln Corsair at its plant in Oakville. In fact, rumors in the press say there may be as many as five electric vehicles coming out of that plant. And Stellantis has announced that it's going to start building electric minivans at its plant in Windsor. So uh, we'll get everybody involved, but starting with you, Flavio, was this just the luck of the draw or what kind of policies did Canada put in place to be able to land these contracts? Well, we're going to have a fulsome conversation. I know that Eric's got a a lot to say about what's very interesting in the ground in places like uh, Quebec and what technology uh, makes the value proposition work. But I'll take us back to the NAFTA renegotiations and uh, the USMCA. Uh, we went from a NAFTA agreement that, uh, you know, for compliance for tariff-free sale, we had uh, 29 parts categories. You had to get to 62.5% and you had a NAFTA compliant car. Now in the new USMCA, we've got twice as many parts categories, but more importantly, right in the middle of it, there's this definition of core parts that at a 75% content level have to be located uh, regionally, you know, within the three countries. And one of them is uh, the heart and soul of electric vehicles. It's uh, the battery, battery and components. And so what we said a couple of years ago when we signed this agreement was, look, on EVs, this favors places, uh, jurisdictions, the states and provinces that uh, that uh, have access to the chemistry and the processing and, and all of the technology that goes around them. Um, and, uh, you know, this stuff, this chemistry, these big battery packs, they don't travel well. And uh, they're, you know, hazardous materials ratings. They don't, they don't go across borders really well. So if you have them, like in northern uh, Quebec, places like Madawaska and, and Val d'Or and northern Ontario, and you've got lithium and cobalt and graphite, uh, and you've got, a, you've got a healthy uh, set of plants around there, like in Ontario, you know, we've got five OEMs here. Um, you know, you're looking as good, if not better, than uh, any of the other states that we compete with. So not a real surprise. But um, but like you said, a real reversal of fortune. Yeah. So, Eric, pick it up from there. I mean, you're uh, looking at battery initiatives. Could Canada, in addition to vehicle assembly, electric vehicle assembly, become a center for manufacturing batteries uh, w- with the full supply chain? Yes, absolutely. In fact, what uh, Flavio was saying, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic transition. And the opportunity that we have in Canada and North America is to build an alternative supply chain to Asia. Let's put it straight. Currently, battery manufacturing are 80% done in Asia. But the beauty of where we stand in Canada, we, with Quebec and uh, neighboring provinces, Ontario and everything, we have all the critical mineral in, the, in our underground that we can extract it in a more efficient and uh, in a lower carbon emission uh, footprint than we could, we could do everywhere in the world. That's the first component. So our big focus is really to say Quebec, as at least from our focus point of view, is we can work from the mine to the cell. So we can integrate the pre-cam and the cathode active material and anode active, ma- active material into a cell manufacturing. That then it gets, let's say, assembled into that big component that Flavio was saying, which is the core components of, 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 of the uh, of the CUSMA agreement. We need to be able to have the right proper content of local North American content. 
So that's where the play is, and we believe we can build and say a fantastic uh, evolution to the industry in that sense. Colin, Bloomberg NEF has been all over this uh, electric uh, movement within the automotive industry. How realistic do you think all this is for Canada to emerge really as an EV powerhouse, including not just assembly as we've been talking about, but as Eric and Flavio just mentioned, batteries as well. Yeah, I fully agree with what Flavio and Eric have, have said. And I'll just add a couple more things to it, which is one that the, the high level signal from the federal government on the long term trajectory out to 2040 of, of phasing out internal combustion engine vehicle sales is really important here, too. We've seen that in many markets where automakers are making bigger investments uh, in electric vehicles, of course, in the markets where the government is sending a signal that that's where things are going. So. The federal government signal really matters there. The other thing that really matters is that large parts of Canada already have a, a relatively decarbonized electricity supply, right? So places like Quebec, places like British Columbia are running mostly on hydro, and even places like Alberta, you've seen a pretty dramatic decline in, in the share of coal generation in that, in that grid. So I, I think those factors mean that if we're looking at total emissions and long-term emissions trajectories for Canada, um, electrification of transport is a very good way to reduce overall emissions. And, and, and I think there's more and more recognition that as you look out further and further, there's more and more countries who are saying, look, we want to get total emissions all the way down to net zero by around 2050. You really can't do that without significant amounts of electrification of transport, almost fully electrifying some parts of transport. So I think all of those things together are giving automakers more confidence that, yeah, that that's a good place to set up. And I do think it's realistic for Canada to own a significant part of the value chain in that. Uh, we do a big ranking of, uh, of the supply chain for uh, batteries and going into EVs, and Canada comes out quite favorably for that. So I think there are some real investment opportunities. There's still more work to be done, but, but I think it is coming together. Eric, uh, Colin makes a great point there of Canada having a much greener grid, largely hydropower driven. That's good for not just uh, charging electric cars, which is critically important, but as you know, for the manufacture of the batteries, which are very energy intensive to manufacture. And yeah. unless done within a green grid or green energy, are actually contributing or, or maybe not diminishing the carbon footprint as much. So tell us a little bit about what you've got to offer in terms of not just uh, clean electricity for charging, but also for manufacturing. Well, uh, without the, obviously say putting out its name, any name out there, but we are in conversation with our project of battery strategy with Investment Quebec and, and in Hydro Quebec and also in, including the Minister of Economy. And many of the uh, cathode active material talking to us are demanding for putting their operation in, in place. Ranges of 100 to some of them, you say in the two to 300 megawatt of capacity. So this is the size of an aluminum smelter capacity. So Quebec has been quite a, a good demonstration of being a building to say the green aluminum uh, footprint. This is exactly the same type of, of story we can build around battery manufacturing now with our clean energy, low carbon footprint. And obviously we have a, our electricity is one of the cheapest of an America almost in many places. So like Colin is saying, I mean, yes, we already have many places, but we have abundant capacity in Quebec. So this makes us say the whole sense of building the high density of energy to build a stable, secure, sustainable supply of, of battery components and bring it to the OEM market where Ontario is transitioning their operation and many of the, uh, say, the Northeast area as well. So we see that as a, as a good, as a, as a synergy that makes total sense, John. Flavio, uh, you know, it's great we're talking about batteries, but what about uh, the rest of the supply chain, electric motors, the inverters, the power electronics and, and the like? Are those things that your members can manufacture for electric vehicles? They certainly are. You know, we've, we're running a demonstration project here called Project Arrow with the association. We said, look, we're going to design and engineer a, a, a vehicle built to 2025 year, uh, 2025 model year uh, specs. And, um, you know, our theory is we can do the whole thing in Canada. You know, we ran an RFP. I got 302 companies interested. And what's interesting out of that 302 is, um, you know, uh, most of the auto sector is here in Ontario in this 250-mile corridor from Detroit to Toronto. But, you know, 40 of those companies came from Quebec. And those companies are battery thermal and management tech, AI, uh, battery trays, um, uh, uh, all of the little different components uh, 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 
uh, motor uh, vehicle motors, uh, e gears. You know, we we go across the country and we find a company sitting in Alberta that does lithium ion cells from oil and gas wastewater. You know, you go all the way to the other end of the coast, and one of the world's central nodes on on uh, uh, fuel cells is uh, British Columbia. We certainly have everything, but what I warn everybody is that we've got everything we need in the ground. We've got all the assembly plants that could that could drive the type of demand that makes uh, a good mining pro forma. But right in the middle, we've got uh, processors. Uh, we don't have enough. And that processing, uh, those companies are not charities. So, you know, we, we talk with uh, provincial governments and federal governments and we say, look, the role of government here is you did your job with uh, those uh, with the with the with the big three. Uh, don't worry about the supply chain. We'll figure that part out. If we get orders, uh, our pro forma works. But make sure that uh, in this next two or three critical years, before Ford starts making cars, uh, battery electric vehicles in, in Oakville, that you've done something with the, the big processing uh, firms. Uh, because if you don't, uh, you know, we're going to miss out on a, a domestic opportunity. And a lot of those foreign suppliers that Eric talks about, that Colin knows very well, uh, may find a solution where they bring the cell in. And then we've lost the opportunity to uh, to take advantage of an of uh, of uh, uh, competitive advantages that I think we have over probably every U.S. auto state, uh, not including Nevada, which is now a new auto state. <laughs> right. So, Colin, wh what do you make of that? What are the opportunities for Canada to to really become very vertically integrated in the supply chain? Because I don't know the stats for Canada, but they're probably similar to the U.S., any of the lithium that's mined here, any of the rare earth metals, or most of them, go to China for refinement and processing. Is that something that Canada can truly pick up and do in-house as it were? Yeah, and uh, let me just tie it back to what we were talking about earlier too, because I think there's an important point here around the life cycle emissions and why, why that matters. And when we talk about life cycle emissions, one of the things we're seeing, of course, all auto uh, emissions regulations today are tailpipe based regulations, right? Um, with some upstream accounting for, for power generation in some cases. But what we're seeing is more and more talk, not anytime soon, not this time, not, not this year, not next year, not the year after, but as we get towards 2030, pushing more of those uh, regulations away from just tailpipe and towards life cycle. So then that whole picture of where is the battery made, where is the car made, really starts to matter a lot more. The other thing that comes up that I think is still a really big opportunity where we still see some gaps is around recycling. So we are seeing more investments on battery recycling. And mostly actually when you go out and talk to a lot of these groups, we've, we've built some, some models looking at the economics of recycling and, and the flows of that material right now. Almost all of them, the main response they say is, we actually don't have enough to recycle yet. The, the cars are lasting longer than we thought they were going to. The batteries are lasting longer than we thought they were going to. But that's coming. That's starting to, that's gonna start to come in the 2020s and then the volumes are gonna start to go up very quickly from there. And so I think that's an opportunity, not just because that creates jobs and investment, but also it means you only import the raw materials once. So there are always going to be global supply chains. There is always going to be some of these materials moving across borders. But the main thing you don't want to do is replicate the current dependence you have with fossil fuel infrastructure on importing the, those, those molecules from another country and instead be replicating that dependency with, with some of the raw materials for batteries. You may still have to do it a little bit, but you don't want to do it over and over every year. And I think recycling is probably the area that helps you tackle that the most. So that's one of the areas we're watching really closely to see which countries go out and really try and grab that. So far, that is China. But I think we're we're at the very beginning of that race. If you think about recycling lags when the, the, the vehicles are and batteries are made by sort of 10, 12 years, um, we're, we're a long way from, from that start. We're just at the starting gun, I should say there. Uh, unlike on the battery manufacturing side where we're sort of well into the race right now. On the recycling, there's still all to play for. And, and I think that's an important area to watch. Yeah, Eric, I'd love to get your input on that because I think that's absolutely critical with Colin just raised recycling. And and yes, there are small demonstration projects that show it can be done. What I'm curious is where, where do we get to the point where it can be done in high volume and where the recycled materials are at cost parity with virgin material? Because we can see other uh, uh, materials in cars, plastics, for example, where recycled plastic is more expensive than virgin plastic and there's not much market demand for it. So what's your vision or your outlook for recycled materials being able to be done at high volume and be cost effective? 
There are different trends that is coming up in the industry. And uh, first of all, in a nearby, let's say, North American point of view, I mean, we can build that concept that Colin is explaining, and people can picture that calling it an urban mine. Essentially, if we put in place the right recuperation, like you bring back your, your, your can of beer and you recycle your aluminum, we could put a value to that. And there's no secret that there are many jurisdictions that are putting a price to that recuperation, value, that, that, that residual value of that battery. And you're right, Colin, that the, the battery of the car are lasting much longer. The, I had the, the experience of having a, an early, an early uh, Californian electric car in 2012. And when I got rid of it a few years ago, the battery has not degraded by 2% a bit. So, I mean, they are built to last much longer than we expect. But the manufacturing of battery, they have a number of reject. There's a certain percent and it ranges depending on their level of stability and see Colin and you're, you're nodding. So this is already an opportunity to recuperate those elements instead of getting rid of it and putting it back into the supply. So our industry of recuperation and recycling can build up on that on get capacity. And as the cars start to have, let's say, more end of life, because the battery can be reused, repurposed as energy storage component, and then can also be recycled. There's two options of, of, of using those batteries. So that's the where John it goes. Now, how much of the of the uh, of many regulation in European country or even let's say in North America could put some obligation to recuperate that and bring them back back into the uh, the, the, the 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 sourcing? That's where I mean, hopefully, government will uh, will pick up on that. So we could put a price to it and and f facilitate that in a sense. You know, we've been talking a lot about supply chain and uh, and all that. Infrastructure is another critical element. Uh, Flavio, let's go to you. I mean, we need in both Canada and the U.S., in fact, the world, a whole lot more charging stations. Is that something that your organization is tackling? Is that opportunity for your members? In some of the technology that goes into the charging, yes, of course, uh, lots of members are playing in that. The The cost of setting up a, the, a charging station or a network of charging stations that can make a dent uh, in, uh, in the driving behaviors is prohibitive. You know, it 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 it'll ruin a supply a supplier's uh, pro forma. It'll ruin an OEM's pro forma. Um, so we're looking at partnerships uh, on the Canadian side. Uh, just being creative uh, with the federal government, we've engaged uh, Canada Post. Canada Post has got 6,500 postal stations across the country. Some of them are in the back of pharmacies, but a lot of them are standalone buildings. You know, if, uh, there may be a role here for the federal government to say, look, this is a state-owned property. Uh, it can accommodate. Uh, some inbound and outbound traffic, and uh, you know perhaps that first generation of charging infrastructure is the role of the is the role of the of the uh, public sector. You know, um, uh, as you know, John, uh, of course, a uh, hundred years ago, one hundred and ten years ago, the the uh, Detroit Electric was uh, one of the uh, was one of the the more prominent OEMs uh, running taxi cabs in uh, New York City. Uh, what happened was that we figured out that uh, we can get uh, more energy density out of a out of a uh, out of a, uh, a gallon of uh, gasoline than we could out of lead acid batteries, and so that infrastructure, that fossil fuel infrastructure, built up all uh, over those years. A lot of those fossil fuel companies, of course, are going to be looking at a decline in in um, in demand, and maybe a repurposing of their facilities, but. I think it's one of these things, it's one of these big uh, transition moments in uh, transportation where the role of big governments in other jurisdictions will put them at an advantage vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Canada if the Canadian government doesn't figure out that, uh, look, from a technology standpoint, we can figure it out. From uh, uh, resources in the ground, we can figure it out. You've got to act as the bridge. So process the materials, but also help uh, Canadians ease their anxiety on range. I don't know that we have range anxiety like we talked about 10 years ago, but it certainly is part of the package. And I'd really like to figure out how I can fill up my battery in five minutes. And um, that takes a lot of money. It sure does. Colin, what is your investigations and reportings at Bloomberg NEF turn up in terms of getting the proper infrastructure in, in place? And by the way, we may as well talk about getting consumers more involved in buying these cars. So yeah, uh, first on the infrastructure, I mean, the first thing to note is that it's happening really fast. So the infrastructure is getting built. So we track every public charging station installed in the world. Um, you've gone from a few tens of thousands 
um, five, six, seven years ago to uh, 1.3 million installed at the end of last year globally. Now, some countries are, are running ahead there, and in, in some cases, they're, they're, they're doing so with significant amounts of government support. But a couple other interesting trends we're seeing. One of them uh, that, Flavio talked, uh, or that Flavio touched on was around um, oil majors getting more into the game. That's so far mostly a European phenomenon. So groups like Shell, groups like Total, um, groups like BP and Equinor uh, in Norway, all, all making very big investments in, in, in public charging infrastructure, not just at their forecourts of their gas stations, uh, which they own more of in Europe than they do in North America, where they're more often franchised out, um, but also just in other forms, like uh, lamppost charging, for example, a, a group that does that uh, was just acquired recently here by an oil major. Um, so we're seeing more and more activity from those groups. We're also seeing more activity from big utilities, from big energy suppliers. And that takes different forms depending on the structure of the electricity market in the individual country you're in, because some of that's still vertically integrated. Uh, of course, in Canada, a lot of it is, but not all of it. So it just depends a bit where you are and the form that takes and the degree to which regulators are allowing uh, electric utilities to make some of those investments and recoup those costs through parts of the rate base. But that's an area I think we'll see more on in the next few years more acknowledgement that there is some room to treat at least part of that investment, maybe right up to the post itself, all the grid infrastructure improvements and reinforcements needed for that as part of uh, our normal electricity network. If you think about the original mandate of a lot, a lot of electricity distribution um, companies, it was really around to serve load wherever load is. Um, and there's nothing to me that says uh, heating someone's hot tub is inherently more uh, appropriate than, he, than charging someone's car. Um, I think that it's very legitimate to say that these are additional sources of demand that maybe we didn't foresee 30 years ago, but now are there and are, are part of the infrastructure that we can build or that we have built out, we can expand it to serve them. So I think there's a role for quite a few different players there. And I think there's also quite a patchwork of different technology solutions that are going to play a role here. So you're going to have a lot of slower charging wherever cars are parked at night, uh, whether that's at home uh, or even parked during the day. But you do probably need a, a relatively robust network of, of fast chargers at highways uh, to get the real mass adoption of people who still want to do road trips and, and still want to feel comfortable doing that. But I think we haven't tapped out how far you can go without huge investments on, the, on that yet. There are a lot of two car families in Canada. There are a lot of people who for whom one of those cars can go electric and mostly just be used as a commuter charging up at home and at work. So. There's a lot of a lot of moving pieces on this topic. Uh, a lot of things happening very quickly. I'm pretty optimistic that we can solve it. Auto sales globally are about 2.3 trillion dollars a year. If EVs are really going to be cheaper, we can solve the infrastructure part because that's putting a lot of money back into consumers' pockets. Yeah, great point. Go ahead, Eric. In fact, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's almost something evident when you're driving an electric vehicle, but for people who haven't, haven't made the jump, we have to keep in mind, and Colin, and you know that for a fact, and everyone, many of the EV owners here online knows that, but we're charging our electric vehicle at destination, at home and at work, 80% of the time, if it's, if it's even more. Because our car are idle long period of, a day, of, of our days. So this changed the dynamic of having to go to the gas station completely. And now the, the charging, the public charging infrastructure becomes part of the longer transit demand. So that, that for people, we really have to get into it to realize that you're charging so many, so many off, so many time simply from your final destination, as long as you have the ability of that slow charging capacity that is not that demanding overall to the network. It's, and it's feasible, like you're saying, Colin, it's, it's, it's a, from, from, it's not a very complex engineering issue from, from an electric electrical point, point of view. Flavio, is the APMA taking a position on this? More government investment for infrastructure, more incentives for consumers, or or what is the, the stance of the organization? You know, we had a new government in Ontario. A couple of governments ago, I worked for the government that brought in the the EV incentives for purchasers. Uh, when this new government came in and they said that they were going to cancel it, I said, uh, shockingly to some people, sure, go ahead and take them away, but reinvest that money that you were going to do in, in consumer incentives on vehicles made somewhere else, usually overseas, and put it into uh, uh, the negotiations with the OEMs that would commit the anchor product. Uh, there, there certainly is a, a role for government here. Uh, I think uh, the other two have touched on it. Uh, you know, these these global mandates in major markets like uh, California, Japan, UK that say 
look, you can't sell an internal combustion engine only vehicle in this in this uh, air, in this jurisdiction by 2035. That moves the sticks. Uh, that's the best role of government. And, uh, you know, we're going to see kind of a hockey stick in EV adoption uh, at that point. Flavio, we're getting down towards the end here. But uh, what about uh, maybe beyond just government payouts for this? Tax policies and the like strategies uh, that would encourage this, not just government handouts. Well, look, uh, the Obama government, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the bailout said, look, uh, we're going to provide you a whole lot of money. OK, but what we want to see is a doubling in the cafe standard. We want to see you go to 54 miles per gallon. And industry had to respond by spending hundreds of billions of its own dollars in developing uh, more lightweight vehicles and better uh, combustion. If if uh, we turn around and say, look, the mandate is uh, you can only sell uh, EVs or uh, plug in hybrids or what, uh, you know, however you set it. Um, at zero emission vehicles, the industry will look in on itself and say, what money am I spending on internal combustion development? And what money am I spending on transmissions? And turn around and say, look, that's dead. And uh, as long as the government follows through and doesn't back off and, and, uh, uh, and we all have to go there, they'll spend the money. Real good. We're going to have to wrap it up. Flavio, Eric, Colin, thanks so much for your time and your insights today. Really good discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank thanks. you very much. Have a great day. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. 